Great to see you today. Hey, when I was a kid, um, I used to love to climb trees. Anybody? Uh, yeah, all right, let's go. Um, I, my mom tells me when I was really little, uh, I would cl I'd start climbing things, like in the kitchen or something, before I could even walk. She'd find me up on top of things, and um, I don't know. I don't, maybe I'm not stopped seeking to climb up all kinds of things. I remember when I was probably at elementary age, uh, I was climbing some trees in our backyard, uh, and I still have this very, really vivid kind of moment. There are probably several of them. I climbed this tree, get way up high. We had big, tall pine trees, if you've been to North Carolina. Um, we have little scrawny trees around here, by the way, but really tall trees. And pine trees are hard to climb. But I would climb up one tree, and if I could make it over to another, and get over there. And, but I remember taking a, like a board, like wood, up with me. I was climbing up a tree just so I could get it up there and prop it in such a way that I could just sit up there. And I would sit up there for a while and look down on the neighborhood, like oh, above everything, over our roof, like looking from the backyard into the front yard. And I could see the mailman. He was coming over. I could see him. He couldn't see me. I could see, I could see, oh, there goes our neighbor's car. They pulling in. Oh, I see them. I remember just thinking, even then, I was like, man, God must look at the world like this. Like my little world. It was like looking probably at a Richard Scary book or something. Like there goes that car. There goes another truck. And I could see it all and nobody knew I was watching. I thought this must be the kind of perspective that the Lord has on us. I thought it was the coolest thing. Uh, and then... Then I grew up, right? And what I know is true today still, and it's true in your life, your heart. It's in part why you're here today, all right, as we set this message up. You're here because you believe that stepping into this time of worship, you came here for a lot of different reasons, lots of motivations here in the room. I think you came here because you thought perhaps you would be able to rise up above it all for a moment and capture a new perspective, maybe from God's vantage point, and capture a life that you've been meant to live. Because let's be honest, we've been down in the grind today, and what we all need is a redeemed imagination and vision of what God would have for us. It's why we sing to him. It's why we worship him as holy we need to get back to awe and wonder that comes by being in his presence and by worshiping him and so let me ask you this question when are you at your very best in life because that's what we're really looking for right when are you at your very what is the good life how about that when are you at your very best and I'm going to, to set it up this way. I believe, having thought about this message for a long time, we're at our very best, particularly as Christians, right? This is true of every person. We're at our very best when we're living like Jesus, right? To become more like him is to experience the joyful life. We talked about it last week. We looked at the rich young ruler and we said this, that the problem, here's one of the problems, is we are always pursuing happiness. And I've come to this recently. I've, I've turned the phrase. We say, well, money can't buy happiness. But you know what? The truth is it can. For a moment. Or how about this? If that's what you're looking for. If you're looking for happiness, you might get it because mon money uh, gives you access. Gives you access to health care, to, to, gosh, better food, I guess. Uh, you know, support when you need help in terms of your, your own health. It, it helps you have access to things. But happiness is based on circumstance. And Jesus is after something much deeper than happiness. What he wants and what you want, even if you don't know it, you want joy. You want to experience the fullness of Christ regardless of what you're going through. And let's admit it, we've had some challenging days this week. I'm just guessing. I've been with some of you. You've had a hard week. I mean, I, I know that funerals continue to take place among our beloved members. I know that we have many who are ill who can't be here today. 
You've had some challenges this week. We all have. What you need is joy. And here's the insidious thing about happiness. It's the very thing that's keeping you from joy. The pursuit of it. We've talked about this before. It's the paradox of hedonism. You will not find happiness by pursuing happiness. You find it by pursuing something else. We know as Christians, you find it by pursuing someone else. It's found in a pursuit of Jesus. And what we discover, here it is, this is our focus today, we find unexpected generosity in our lives. Now, immediately when we say generosity, we think of money, don't we? And I just want to offer my, my uh, encouragement as well as your pastor, um, Rodney, noted earlier. It is just amazing. And I'm going to speak to our guests who are here today because uh, our members know this, but it's, it's worth celebrating the generosity of our people, of you. You know, Stacy and I, many of us, all families, many of us said single adults, even young people, what can I do to help us as a church family? And we all came together. We said, you know, I'm going to give above and beyond the tithe. Or I'm going to give in, in extraordinary ways. And that's how we, we, we came back to where we need to be as we finish out the rest of this fiscal year. So we, yes, we think about money when we think about generosity. And yes, this is, it'll come into play today. But what I want you to focus on is, is generosity as a comprehensive way of life. We're talking about being generous with our words. Aren't you at your best living the good life when your words are uplifting and you don't withhold, you're not stingy about encouraging and loving others. Isn't that when you're at your best? Everybody around you would say that. Aren't you at your best when you're generous with your time? When you say, I don't really have time to do that, but that person's in need, I'm going to help them. And you're blessed. I don't have time to make that call or reach out to that. I know they're struggling, but I, I don't have time for that. Instead, I'm going to sit down and watch television for a while. Right? We're at our very best when we decide not to hold back any kind of love. You're at your best when you give your full attention. You give your time. You listen. This is when we're at our best. So to be generous is to be with your money, your resources, your home, all that you have. And I'm trying to convince you as we dive in, that's the good life. And Jesus told us that was the case. In fact, that's what the whole Beatitudes, the Sermon on the Mount is all about. That's what his life is all about. It's just loving others in a way that we seek to be loved ourselves, the way that he loves us. I did a, a, a wedding this past week in the chapel and I gave the, the couple this charge. I said, okay, here it is. Here's your to-do list. Love God with everything you've got. Love each other just like Jesus and do stuff. That's it. Love God, love each other like Jesus, live your life. The great commandment is exactly that and that's what he's called us to. And so today we're going to look at what it is. To whom much is given, much is required. And we've all been given much. So we're going to look at Luke chapter 19 is where we are. Turn to everybody. Grab a Bible. If you don't have it there with you, you've got one in front of you. Luke 19, we're going to be looking at just 10 verses of a famous story. While you're turning there, um, this is a story of Zacchaeus. The wee little man is who he is. A wee little man. Uh, little man was he, right? We know the song, perhaps. We love this story. This story is filled with awe and wonder, enchantment. It's such a fun, kind of whimsical story. We even tell it to our kids, right? We got songs we sing about. Because this story connects with all of us. This is such a beautiful story. And we're going we're gonna to dive into it. And here's what I want you to see. I, uh, as I always do, lots of commentary work around this passage. And uh, I'm indebted to people like Tim Keller or, or Martin Lloyd-Jones and even Charles Spurgeon and others who uh, have, have taught or, re or uh, written much about this text. And so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go with an outline that actually kind of spiritualizes uh, what literally happens here. Because I think you can remember this because you already know the story. So you'll see where I'm going, but I'm going to unpack each of these. And if, you're right, if you take notes on sermons, here it is. We're going to break it down this way. 
If you want to become this generous person, okay, if you want to live a good life, if you want to enter into the kingdom of God, is what Jesus would say, you're going to have to climb a tree. You're going to have to get above the crowd, get beyond the crowd, and you're going to have to take Jesus home with you. All right, so let's look at this. Look at verse one of chapter 19. He entered Jericho and was passing through. Now we know exactly where Jericho is. It's there today. Um, in fact, I've been to Jericho on uh, my first trip to, to the Holy Land. Jericho is, you might know this, it's, a, it's an oasis uh, town that's about, let's say, northwest, if you know a map, northwest of the Dead Sea. It's so on the way, Jesus is coming down, he's on his way to Jerusalem, right? This is whole series is, are those who encounter Jesus on his way to the cross. We've said that in Luke 9, 31, it says, when, when he knew it was time for him to be lifted up, he turned his face toward Jerusalem. So he's on his way to Jerusalem, and here he counters, look at this, and behold, there was a man named Zacchaeus. And here's all we need to know about him. We know much about him because of this. He was a chief tax collector, and he was rich. And he was seeking to see who Jesus was. But on account of the crowd, he could not because he was, a small, he was small in stature. He was, he was short. He was a small man. Someone said vertically challenged. So this is about 27 miles uh, from Jerusalem. Jesus on the way. Jericho is a beautiful town. Um, as an oasis, it had lots of trees, in fact, and lots of flowering trees and lots of flowers. It was a place that, in fact, Herod the Great had a sprawling winter palace there where he'd go hang out in the wintertime, uh, which is still there. Uh, if you go to the Holy Land, you know that Herod just liked to build stuff, is what he did. And he had a palace there uh, and a lot of royal people. It was a place to be and lots of, of money in this town. And lots of taxes to be had and to be taken for the Roman, the occupying nation, right? They would have Jewish people to work for them. They were puppets for the state, and they would get the taxes from the people being able to speak the language, as it were. Zacchaeus is running a pyramid scheme. He's got people under people. Uh, he's a chief tax collector. He would take off the top, and the more he took off the top, you likely know, the more he would make. So the Romans were just playing him, and they didn't like him. They're just using him. If he couldn't raise taxes, they'd get rid of him. And the Jewish people didn't like him because he was a sellout, and he was working for this occupying state, right, the Roman Empire. Now, we don't know what his motivation was to see Jesus, but it says he was seeking him. He wanted to see him. He's curious, right? He is very curious about who Jesus is. He's probably heard by now of his healings. There's been a lot of that going on in the book of Luke. Luke is just setting it up. We, he's, his teaching, his teaching was revolutionary. I'm thinking Zacchaeus has heard a couple things about his teaching. One, he seems to be coming against the empire, talking about another kingdom. And I'm intrigued by this guy. He's coming after the Romans in some way, it seems, this revolutionary rabbi. But he also has heard, because the entire book of Luke tells us the story after story, that he welcomes the outsider. So all that we know about Zacchaeus, he's thinking, could it be? I want to see this guy. Maybe he was like Herod. I just want to see the spectacle. Maybe he'll do a miracle. So the crowds are gathering around, but I got a hunch. He's thinking, I, I love to think that it's true. Like some of us here today, I love to think it's true that maybe with all my failure, with all of my sin from the past, I don't have it together today, but maybe I would be welcome. Maybe I would hear Jesus call my name. That's what we all long for. So look at what he did. He's curious. He's seeking. So he ran ahead. He, he's running. No dignified, wealthy person, adult, would be running. He's running, and then he climbs a tree. He climbs up in a sycamore tree for the Lord he wanted to see. For he, he was about to pass by that way. 
Again, no dignified man would be running. If you want to come to Jesus, if you, children, listen to this. Adults, listen. If you want to come to Jesus, he's already said in Luke 18, you're going to have to become like a child. You're going to have to climb a tree. You're going to have to climb a tree. Imagine wealthy Zacchaeus. Got his best suit on. He's got his tie on. He's got his dress shoes on. He's running in his best robe. He's climbing a tree. He's curious. He's doing whatever it takes to get to Jesus. Why would Jesus say you got to become like a child? Because ch children, their lives are filled with awe and wonder. They're innocent. They're seeking to know more. How about this? They know how small they are. They know they're weak. They're powerless in so many ways. They come humbly. They're curious. They're always learning. In fact, kids are so awesome. Kids, uh, kids will see another kid on the playground. Hey, I'm a kid, you're a kid. We're best friends. And then we grow up. You're a kid filled with wonder. Let's play together. When's the last time as an adult you're walking along and go, that tree looks amazing. I'm about to climb that mug. When's the last time you did that? Been a while, probably. This week I've been getting kind of excited. I'm going to climb a tree. Soon and very soon. I'm going to become undignified to get a new perspective. I'm going to become like a child because Jesus said we must do this. If you want to come to Jesus, you're going to have to climb a tree because we grow up and we become disenchanted. That's the word. Look at what happens, verse 5. And when Jesus came to the place, he looked up and said to him, Zacchaeus, hurry and come down, for I must stay at your house today. So he hurried and came down and received him joyfully. I love this. This is such a great story. So he's curious. He runs ahead. He's figuring out a way to see Jesus. He climbs up the tree. Jesus said, hey, Zacchaeus, hurry down. I've got him like a little squirrel. He's scurrying down. I picture him hugging Jesus. Or Jesus hugging him. He says, receive them joyfully. You know Zacchaeus has got a big grin on his face. Why did he run down so quickly? Well, he's finally received, right? But this man is filled with curiosity. He's like a child. He's longing to be accepted. Charles Taylor, the philosopher who wrote a book, uh, really a monumental work, that I've labored through called A Secular Age. It's literally about this thick. And in it, he talks about it historically, how we got to where we are today in the global West. He's the one who really coins this phrase, uses the word, we become disenchanted. It's not a word we use often. What he means is we're no longer filled with awe and wonder and all we think life is is right here. We look at the world from a nat through natural law and we have lost a sense of anything beyond us. We talk about this often. The autonomous self has now figured out, uh, I will be the authority for my life. There's no authority outside of me. And certainly nothing beyond me that I can't see. And what happens in academia, it can happen in, in certain domains of culture. We can teach our kids. Others will try to teach our kids. Okay, here's the thing. Uh, there's no God. I mean, we're not going to bring him into the mix. So you're going to have to just really work hard in school. Maybe you'll make a lot of money, have pleasure along the way, be as happy as you pursue happiness as much as you can. And then you're going to die someday. You'll be buried and your body will rot in the ground. Go enjoy life. This is the message of a secular age. Secular meaning non-spiritual. We know better. Amen? We know that God's word tells us that this is not all there is. Though the world might say, you believe in a God you cannot see. 
Yes, and he created me and you and everything in the world. And you believe that he came in a person, that Jesus was the embodiment of God. Yes, how else would we know exactly who he is? And you believe that he was the son of God. He spoke to us the truth about how we are to live. And if we, wait, wait, wait. And then, then he died on the cross for our sins as a substitute. Yep, I believe that. Okay, and then he was buried and he rose again according to the scriptures that are valid and we already know from the past prophecies that foretold it would happen and it happened. If you receive that by faith, not works, but by faith you receive that, you're saying that that's how you find the good life. That you then live in response to what he's done and that's where life is, that's where joy is found. Yes, that's what I believe. And that's what my brothers and sisters in our church believe. And it's what believers believe and live out throughout the whole world. The gospel has literally changed the world. And that's what many philosophers like Charles Taylor, among others, even more modern Sam Harris, a secular historian, atheist historian, or Jordan Peterson, all that so many millennials and others are listening to. They are going, the Christian message has literally changed the world. Believe it or not, it is true. But why did Zacchaeus hustle down? He didn't know all that I just told you. Why did he rush down to see Jesus? You know what? It's right in, in the text. It's clear. He called him by name. Now, how did, how did Jesus know his name? Now, you might say, well, because he's Jesus. I, no, I have a hunch. I, I, I think this could have happened. A conversation prior to going into Jericho. He's with his disciples. He's with others. They're meeting up with other disciples who are there in the mix. And he, I can imagine Jesus just saying, hey, before we go in, y'all, y'all tell me. I'm just curious. Who's the most hated guy in town? Well, it's a guy named Zacchaeus. But you, you don't see him. You're not going to make friends by hanging out with him. And you're already getting this reputation, by the way. The friend of sinner. They're already talking about it. Okay, wait, wait, what's his name? Zacchaeus. Yeah, where does he live? Or down there, but you know, you'll see his house. I mean, it's a big house. Jesus, that's the guy. That's who I'm going to see. Watch this. I can imagine it. That he comes in. And he sees Zacchaeus and he calls him by name. Zacchaeus is grinning from ear to ear because Jesus, of all the people in Jericho, he calls him out. And he might be getting down as well, looking around at the others going, okay, hey, what's up, y'all? I mean, he's a little, you know, maybe he's a little prideful, but I think he's just shocked the fact that Jesus knows his name and he calls him. If you're going to find Jesus today, friends, you're going to have to climb a tree. Become like a child. Secondly, you're going to have to get above the crowd. And I mean above and beyond the crowd. We saw it already in verse 3. It's why he got in a tree. But watch this in verse 7. He's going to have to move past the crowd, and you are too. And when, he, when they saw it, what is it? When they saw it, what? This radical grace. <laughs> When they saw Jesus calling out the bad guy who everybody hated, saying, that's my guy, I'm coming to your house. When they saw that, they, uh-oh, who are they, all grumbled. He has gone in to be the guest of a man who's a sinner. It was this radical embrace of Jesus of a man who didn't deserve his love. But look at what happens here. Zacchaeus is going to have to get beyond all the opinions of others. Clearly, he's had to live this way. But notice who's coming after him. It's the moralistic. It's the judgmental. 
the critics. Criticism begats more criticism. This word grumble means, and it's clear, I suppose, out loud, they're, they're, they're criticizing, they're grumbling about this. They're talking about it. And, and criticism begats more criticism. Let me tell you what I think about him. Hey, you know what he did to me? Hey, my family, we got burnt by this. Everybody, all of us can get excited about little Zacchaeus unless you've been taken by him. Unless he stole from you. You see, but if, if you were one that he, he took advantage of, you may not be as excited. So we too can be like this. He was already hated. Hatred has not changed his life. Only love can do that. Only grace can change a life like yours and like mine. And some of us need to hear this today. Don't believe the voices around you. Don't believe all those who might bring up your past sins. And can I say it? You know it's true. The person that's speaking to you more than anyone in the world is yourself. And no one is speaking lies into your mind and your heart more than you. The evil one. Speaking into your heart and your life. But if you've come to faith in Christ, you've received his grace because you heard him call your name. There was a day when you heard it. And today for someone here, today is your day. He's calling your name. He knows your name. He knows your past. He knows all that you've done. He knows the deepest, darkest sin of your life. And he's saying, come down. I'm coming to your house. And y'all, the word that he uses there, I'm going to stay at your house is the word meno in the Greek. You know it. It's in John 15, other places where Jesus says, hey, Abide in me. Eugene Peterson's, uh, the message says, make yourself at home in my love and I will make myself at home in you. He says, I'm coming to your house, but more than that, I'm coming in. I'm going to stay with you. Commentators note that what's happening, he stayed with him. And that would have caused quite a stir if not a protest out in front of his house. Jesus stays with him. In fact, there seems to be a gap of time in verse 7. I've never noticed this before, but it seems like he's already gone to Zacchaeus' house. Now they start talking. Look at him. He's already gone. He's the, the, if he was a true prophet, he, would, he wouldn't welcome this guy. He didn't know what he's doing. You see, some of us need to move beyond the crowd of people who've been standing in the way of us coming to Jesus. And can I say it, some of us here, people who have claimed to be Christians in your life who have let you down, maybe someone from your past, maybe it's some inconsistent person in your life, maybe it's you've been hurt, disappointed by those who claim to be followers of Jesus. You're going to have, sorry, you're going to have to move past that because it's not about them. It's not about the naysayers, the haters, the cynics. For some of you, those people are in your family. And you're having to step past them. You're going to have to move past the messages that are being played on repeat in your mind. You're going to have to turn off the moralistic, religious, prideful, judgmental voices that you've heard in your life from others and from yourself. And you're going to have to become like a child. You're going to have to climb a tree. You're going to get past the crowd, the voices in your head. And you're going to have to then take Jesus home with you. I want you to see this, the last point. Take Jesus home. Because what we learn in this story is that it's not about the moralist. It's not about the immoralist, evidently. It's not about the religious or the irreligious. And, and I was convicted with this. I'm going to share my heart here. I was convicted today. I was looking at the crowd grumbling. And I thought, okay, where might I be kind of prideful like that? And I must admit, some, every, all of our members know this, know me well enough to know, graceless Christianity makes me crazy. When Christians aren't, ex, you know, offering grace to others and loving others, 
But you know what? There takes a bit of self-righteousness to be upset with self-righteous people. <laughs> and when that hit me this week, I oh, wow. I may not be on the graceless side, but I might be over here. You don't get the gospel. Get with it. Love people like I do. And the Spirit convicted me because, again, the gospel is not for the religious elite. It's not for the irreligious. It's not for those who are good enough to make it because nobody is. And it's not for those who will never be good enough, who are far from God. I mean, it's, it's for everybody is the point. It's for all of us. It's for Zacchaeus. But you're going to have to move beyond the barriers to get there, okay? So, again, the last thing I want you to see, and this is where it all comes home. Take Jesus home with you. Again, the word may know, it's to stay with him. This is amazing. Look at verse 8. What happens when he, when he takes him home? He encounters Jesus, and Zacchaeus stood and said, standing up is like, let me proclaim something. And said to the Lord, Behold, that's the way, look at this. Don't miss this. Lord, the half of, of my goods I give to the poor. This is his response to love, to acceptance. And if I have, if I have defrauded anyone of anything, I restore it fourfold. Now that was according to the law. There was a fourfold restitution in the law. And he's saying, I'm doing what the law requires. But he's going beyond that. Jesus says to him as he responds with proof that his life has been changed. Not just, I'm going to try better. He's going to do this. And so Jesus then says, today salvation has come to this house. <laughs> I love that. And then look at what he adds. Since he also is a son of Abraham. He's not simply saying, hey, listen, all of you people, self-righteous grumblers, He's one of you. He's saying more than that. To be a son of Abraham is to receive and obey God by faith. So note, don't miss this. Notice the order of salvation. He, he, he comes to the Lord. He receives the Lord gladly. Then he proves that he has been changed. And the Lord says, Salvation has come, and everyone can see it. He doesn't say, get your act together, and I'll come to your house. You know, if you'll, if you'll do all these things, then I will come to you. And some of us need to hear this today. You can come to him as you are. And there's no greater transformation of a life than one that is self-focused, that then suddenly becomes focused on everybody else. Because when grace walks in the front door, greed walks out the back door. And that's what happens in every life. And friends, I want this for you. I'm still growing in the Lord, but I've learned this about my life. When I decide to love others for free, when I decide to outlove others, and when, when I just say, you know what? Uh, I can tell something's not right with you. You're not, you're kind of angry. You're not real happy today. What I have learned, if I can be like Jesus and press into that and say, I'm going to love you today. Oh, it's such a freeing way to live. Choose ahead of time to live just like Jesus. Live your life. Will you do it? You've already heard it. Open-handed. The good life is lived when you say, my time can be offered to other people. What are you going to do this week? How is the Spirit speaking into your heart? Be generous with your finances. How will you do that? And thus prove that you belong to him. How will you be generous with your calendar this week? How will you receive someone? I mean, look at what he does. He gives. He makes amends. Making all things right around him with relationships and otherwise. And, and he receives, he welcomes Jesus into his home. Welcome Jesus into every aspect of your life. Where have you relegated him to other places 
what part of your life you would say, yeah, Jesus not really welcome there. I've, I've talked about it before. It's like, you know, those who were, were baptized uh, today got up there and, and, and someone, someone noted, yeah, that guy, he, he got baptized, but he, 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 he was dunked, but he held his wallet. He kept his wallet out of the water. He's okay, I'm still good. Where have you not been baptized? If you have come to faith in Christ, what area of your life have you not given over to him? You, you hear, hear the message, the challenge. I'm just trusting the spirit speaking to you to live a generous life with everything you have, generous with your words, generous with all that you are, that's the good life. Because it is really better to give than to receive. We read it earlier. I love the passage, and we'll close here. 1 Timothy 6. As for the rich, that would be all of us in this present age, charge them not to be haughty. Don't be prideful. This is really the story of Zacchaeus. Don't set your hopes on the uncertainty of riches, but on God, who richly provides us with everything we have to enjoy, to experience real joy if we hold on to it loosely and share it with others. They are to do good, rich in good works, to be generous, there's the word, and ready to share, thus storing up treasures for themselves as a good foundation for the future so that they may take hold of that which is truly life. As Brother Edward read earlier, truly Zoe life. This is the good life. It's a life of generosity. And so before we close our time, I want you to capture just one single story. As we've been looking at different members within our church, we want you to see uh, a story from a couple who has decided to live a generous life. And so let's watch this. I'm trying to figure out how to rephrase. If I keep, if I, how to rephrase if the I stay quiet, then he'll start talking. No, so I'm really trying. I'm very comfortable with silence. I know. Why do we, why do we, why serve? Do we serve? Well, first of all. Well, yeah. biblically. So yeah, they, I know that's where I was going. I know. Biblically, okay, but. biblically. Okay. When I graduated college, I went on the mission field and I met this guy. Uh, Eastern Europe, so Slovakia and Poland and then, then they found out we liked, we liked each, each other, other, so they sent me to England and her to India. Because you can't be on the mission field and dating. Because, yeah. you know, you're, there's small groups, and so, like, if you break up, it's just not good. So, um, we got married. We've been married 20 years. When we moved back to town, we talked to Craig's friends, and they all said, you need to look for a really strong children's department, and PCBC has that. Because you want a church for the whole family, not just for that moment of your life. It was a perfect fit. Right for then and still to this day, so. We needed a place to serve and... Together. Together, yes, absolutely. We wanted to serve together. Real quickly got involved in high school um, and have been doing that for 16 years. 15, 15? yes, 15, no. 16. Anyway, stay around Something there. Something like that. Yeah, just started on Sunday mornings and, you know, starting to build relationships. All of a sudden we had high school girls coming in and spending time with our children and building relationship with our babies. And it was a godsend. I had four kids. Um, under the age of seven. We were serving them on Sunday mornings, but they were also, they were helping us. And, um, and we got to involve our kids in this. So like when we have high school kids over at our house, we're getting to model them what it looks like to be in service to the church. We, we started on the mission field. Um, we always envisioned ourselves being missionaries. And that ultimately wasn't our calling. Uh, Lord has blessed us with, with other ways of of serving. And at the end of the day, you don't have to make it difficult. Um, I know there's a lot of people who are scared, for instance, to open their home because they feel like their home has to be perfect and, and cleaned up and spotless. I'm a and, mess. And, and I'm a mess. Which, our house is a mess. Like these kids come in and it and it looks the same as when they left. And if if everyone in the church is volunteering and stepping up and doing what Christ has called us to do, to serve. Either through service or through monetary giving or whatever. Both. Or both, yeah, yeah, absolutely. Then that's how the community and the church body and our kids and our adults are all going to experience God's love. Amen. Praise the Lord. It takes all of us, just like the Wilsons. We all have a part, right? Yeah, and I love that. Yes. Okay, give, gen give. Give your, your resources and money, but you, you give your time. You open your home. 
That's what it looks like to be open-handed. How are you doing that? And how is the Lord calling you to do that today? Because it all begins with his love for us, right? 2 Corinthians 8, 9 says this. For you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ that though he was rich, yet for your sake he became poor so that you might, by his poverty, you might become really, truly rich. Hey, let's pray together. I want to ask you, how has the Lord been speaking to you? What will you do? How do you need to live a more generous life? Share it with him right now. Tell him, like Zacchaeus, tell him what you will do. Friend, maybe you're here today and, and you have heard today, you've heard him call your name by his spirit. You've heard him call your name. And you need to respond. He wants to come into your life and take over your life. As we've heard de de declared from the start of this service to be Lord and Savior of your life. Receive him now by faith. Lord, come into my heart. Make me the person you've created me to be. I believe. Lord, I thank you for how you have spoken to us, and now it's all left to us to respond. And may we each respond in our own way and be bold to proclaim your love for us and to live generous lives this week. We pray it all in Jesus' name. Amen.